Good afternoon, friends. Salutations. This week we continue our course and are discussing imagery, specifically T.S. Eliot's idea of the objective correlative and what the hell that pretentious phrase actually means, uh, which is a great question. So let's start there, but first let's dive into Eliot's actual words. So here's what Eliot himself said about what the objective correlative is. Quote, the only way of expressing emotion in the form of art is by finding an objective correlative. In other words, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events, which shall be the formula of that particular emotion, such that when the external facts, which must terminate in sensory experience, are given, the emotion is immediately evoked." Unquote. And I think we can all just say together, what? What's Mr. Elliot talking about? Uh, obviously, he's getting at this idea of storytelling needing to be experiential. Uh, experiential meaning that the reader gets to feel things on a sensory level for herself. That she becomes kind of the stand-in uh, for the protagonist in the story. What the character tastes, what the character smells, what the character feels, what they see, hear so on and so forth. These things should be rendered on the page in such a way that it's as though the reader is experiencing these things right along with the character, maybe even as a stand-in for the player, his or herself. The other thing that's really important to notice uh, in Eliot's idea of the objective correlative is the connection that he's pointing out between the internal conflict and the external conflict. I don't I like to use the phrase objective correlative just because I think it sounds pompous and pretentious. And if you say that at a cocktail party in 2011, someone's probably going to punch you in the face. So, assuming you don't want to get punched in the face, I would avoid saying the objective correlative. Maybe we can update that terminology to something that sounds a little bit more contemporary, and we can say mapping images. We are going to try to construct images that map between a character's internal conflict and the external conflict on the page. So let's put a fictitious example together. Let's say there's a woman named Julie, and Julie is incredibly sad. It would probably be a pretty boring beginning for a story if you had Julie just walk on stage and say, by golly, I'm sad. Uh, well, unless Beckett was putting it together. If Sam Beckett had a beginning like that, I would probably buy in and go for the ride. But for the rest of us mere mortals, since we are the rules and not the exceptions, we don't want to have Julie just walk on stage and proclaim that she's sad. We want to find a symbol, some sort of external plot point that we can render in scene so that a reader observes our character in action, and that by the end of the scene, our reader says to herself, wow, that character is really sad. So instead of having Julie run on stage and say, I'm sad, perhaps we make a scene in which Julie is sitting in the park. Uh, it's the middle of the night. Let's say it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and she's sitting on the grass in a public park, and she's drinking red wine out of the bottle. She's sitting there, she's slouched over, drinking and drinking and drinking, and suddenly the sprinklers come on on the park's grass, and Julie is getting soaked. But instead of having the normal reaction that most of us would have, which would be to like jump up and get out of the way of the water, uh, Julie continues to sit there. Her posture doesn't change at all. She continues to sit while getting drenched and continuing to plug away on the hooch. Suddenly, a reader leaves that moment saying to herself, wow, I bet things aren't so good in Julie's life right now. The reader has had the privilege, or the reader has had the pleasure, of putting those pieces together on their own, rather than it being spoon-fed or kind of told directly to the reader by the author herself. So there's been an external image, Julie drinking, in the park in the middle of the night and getting soaked by the sprinklers without fleeing that moment that maps to how she's feeling internally. She's sad, but instead of us just telling the reader that, we found a way to bring it to life in scene. 
So that becomes our chief challenge this week. As you're putting together your weekly assignment for me, try to be thinking of some sort of strong image, some sort of dominant piece that can be on the stage. So as I go through it, I'm experiencing what the character is experiencing. So that by the time I come to the end of that moment, I say to myself, wow, Todd is angry. Rick is a bullion. Sabrina is devastated. You know, whatever particular emotion you're trying to get across doesn't matter. What I want to see is that you're able to externalize the internal plights of your character. The assigned reading this week was a short story called Forgiveness by Rebecca Brown uh, from her short story cycle, The Terrible Girls. Uh, and that, that story is very indicative of the tone of the rest of the story cycle. So if you dug that, I highly recommend picking up the book. It's a, it's a really, really solid read. In that short story, though, we have one lover cutting off and giving her arm to her partner. Uh, the partner has asked for the arm, and so the woman has cut it off and given it to her. Rebecca Brown doesn't really tell us specifically what that image means. It's certainly a surrealist or a postmodern interpretation of the objective correlative. But there's a little bit of wiggle room for interpretation. I bet if five of us read that story, we don't have precisely the same reading on what the severed limb means. You know, perhaps in one reading it's, it's a uh, very straightforward commentary on power dynamics and relationships. How one person can give so much of him or herself in a relationship that they're actually giving themselves away. They're commodifying their body uh, and giving it up freely, probably in a way that isn't, <clears throat> excuse me, probably in a way that isn't healthy for their own sovereign self. But maybe in another reading, uh, you were seeing something else entirely. Maybe you were seeing it more as an indictment on the person who's asking for the limb. Uh, putting your partner in a situation where he or she is doing something that they feel uncomfortable with, uh, but they're going to do it anyway to please their partner. Uh, again, I think it's cool that Rebecca Brown leaves some sort of latitude for interpretation open, and we're able to fill it in on our own. But I think it stands as a very unique, a very interesting, and also a little bit of a twisted example of the objective correlative in action. We have an image that's modifying what's going on for the characters internally, and yet we've found a way to externalize the action on stage so our reader gets to experience in that a very sensory and a very experiential way. It draws them into the action, it lures them deeper into the story. And the more that they're actually feeling what's on the page, rather than just uh, having it uh, told to them on the page, it can be a really nice way to humanize the plight of your characters and really further that bond between reader and protagonists. So think about your own objective correlative this week, and I look forward to seeing your strong image on the page, something external that maps to what's going on for your character in a very emotional sense. Happy writing this week. I look forward to seeing your prose.